Hello, all of you. Uh, I hope you have been following my previous lessons. In the past three lessons, we learned the basic speeds of the aircraft, the runway length definitions, and takeoff and landing weight restrictions. Now it is time to put things together and uh, learn the actual performance lessons. For the purpose of performance, the entire flight can be divided into stages. The first, of course, is the takeoff phase. In this lesson, we shall learn about the takeoff phase. It has been our endeavor to improve the safety record of our flying. Aircraft are manufactured with an aim to satisfy the high standards set by the regulatory authorities. While the general performance requirements are spelt by ICAO, each member state can impose a higher restriction. In this lesson, all such limits have been derived from Joint Aviation Authority, which is the European body that controls all regulatory functions within Europe. Of course, similar agency exists in USA, which is called the Federal Aviation Authority. But in this lesson, we shall be discussing the rules regulations set out by the JAA. Also, we shall be learning about twin engine aircraft only. Please understand there are uh, uh, aircraft manufactured with three engines and four engines which, have, which are governed by different uh, set of rules and regulations. But in this lesson, we shall stick to two engine aircraft performance only. Next, we shall learn all the requirements for all operations from dry runway. There are additional restrictions imposed uh, for uh, wet runway operations which we shall sh learn in our future lessons. Let me introduce you to some more V-speeds. Please uh, recall that uh, in our uh, first lesson, we had uh, learnt about three basic V speeds that is the VMCG, the minimum control speed on ground, VMCA, minimum control speed in air, and VA, the maneuverability speed. Here we are going to uh, see many other speeds. To start with, the V1, the decision speed, the VR, the rotation speed, V lift off lift off speed, VMBE, brake energy speed, V2, take off safety speed, VMU, minimum unstick speed, VS, stalling speed, VS1G, stalling speed at 1G condition and of course earlier we had seen in another lesson of the available distances of the runway. Here we are going to talk about the required distances. These are the accelerate stop distance required, takeoff run required and the takeoff distance required. We will also be discussing some concepts of the balanced field length and uh, we will talk about the screen height at the end of the lesson. V1, the decision speed. V1 is defined as the maximum speed in the takeoff at which the pilot must take the first action. For example, reduce thrust, apply brakes, deploy speed brakes to stop the airplane within the accelerate stop distance. It is determined by field length, configuration and all of weight. By end of the lesson, you will realize that V1 is very, very crucial and a very important uh, speed for you to understand. We will be discussing about V1 in great detail throughout our lesson. Next is VR, the rotation speed. 
It is defined as the speed at which the rotation of the aircraft should be initiated to take off attitude. It should not be less than V1, 105% of BMCA, the speed that allows reaching V2 before reaching a height of 35 feet above the takeoff surface, or a speed that if aeroplane is rotated at its maximum practicable rate, will result in a satisfactory liftoff. That's the definition. Now, uh, uh, just to explain, PR should not be naturally less than V1 and it should be above VMCA, a 5% above VMCA, so that there are no control problems immediately after getting airborne. And the height of 35 feet for uh, reaching V2, there is a significance which we will learn as the lesson progresses. Next is the practicable rate is approximately 3 degrees per second. And uh, the actually the aircraft doesn't get airborne. The pilot just rotates and maintains the attitude and the aircraft will get automatically airborne at V liftoff speed which we will see now. V liftoff. It is the airspeed at which the aeroplane first becomes airborne. So the pilot gently rotates the aircraft, the correct uh, takeoff attitude and the plane will automatically get airborne. That's the V liftoff speed. Next is the VMU, minimum unstick speed. It is the minimum calibrated airspeed at which the aircraft uh, can safely lift off the ground. What happens uh, in aircraft with long uh, body? If you rotate the aircraft below a minimum value, then the attitude required is so high, there is always a, a danger of you touching your tail. Therefore, each aircraft type will have such a minimum unstick speed defined so as to avoid any tail touch. Especially when the aircraft follow weights are very low, then you are likely to arrive at a unstick speed which is less than the minimum unstick speed in which there could be a chance that you may touch the tail. And as it's very clear, the minimum unstick speed with both engines is always less than or equal to minimum unstick speed with one engine. VEF, engine failure speed. It is the calibrated speed at which the critical engine is assumed to fail. V1 can be selected assuming that an engine failure has occurred at VEF. The time which is considered between the critical engine failure at V engine failure and the pilot recognition at V1 is 1 second. V engine failure can never be less than VMCG or it can never be greater than V1. Very self explanatory Next is the VMB, brake energy limit speed. It is defined as the highest speed at which a takeoff can be rejected and the aircraft can be brought to a halt within the braking abilities of the aircraft braking system. Just to explain, the braking effect it depends on the, the type of system which is installed in the aircraft and some of them, they have a limit. So, in some situations, particularly when the aircraft are operating at a very higher altitudes, where the task can be much higher, the brakes efficiency is not adequate to uh, bring the aircraft to a complete halt within the remaining distance available. Therefore, the performance graphs spell out this particular speed. Obviously, you can't have a V1 which is greater than brake energy speed. Next is uh, V tire. Maximum tire speed limit. The tire manufacturer specifies the maximum ground speed that can be reached in order to limit the centrifugal forces and the heat elevation that may damage the tire structure. Thus, V liftoff is always less than or equal to V tire. The reasons are very similar 
as we had discussed for uh, PMVE. The next speed which we shall be seeing is the VS, the stalling speed. The stalling speed is the greater of the minimum calibrated airspeed when the airplane is stalled or the minimum steady flight speed at which the airplane is controllable within the longitudinal control on its stop. The calibrated airspeed equals 94% of the VS1G which is a stalling speed at 1G. They also sometimes refer to a reference stalling speed which is somewhere in between the VS1G and the normal stalling speed. Let me explain with the graph. Here this graph you are familiar with. It is the coefficient on the y axis with the angle of attack on the x axis. Now see the point of CL max. This is the point at which the speed registered is termed as the VS1G. The aircraft experiences a load factor of 1G and it is marked by the alphabet A. Little bit move ahead on the x axis. I want you to notice the point marked by the alphabet B. At this point, the stall is gradually settling in and at point B, the aircraft is stalling. However, the load factor is less than 1G. Now, there is an area in between this VS1G and VS where the load factor is less than 1. This whole area is called the stall area and it is marked by the alphabet C. So, the Reference stalling speed which I was talking is somewhere in between the VS and VS1G. Therefore, we can conclude that VS stalling speed is 0.94 times VS1G. We had earlier learnt in the previous lesson on runway lengths the different distances available. Now here let us try and define the required distances. The only difference is uh, the required distances is the actual distance that will be used up by the aircraft on the extreme conditions. Firstly, the takeoff run required. It is the distance required by the aircraft on takeoff roll from the beginning of the takeoff roll accelerates up to V1, suffers an engine failure, continues with the takeoff, accelerates to VR and gets airborne. Accelerate stop distance required. It is the distance required by the aircraft on the takeoff roll from the beginning of takeoff roll, accelerates up to V1, suffers an engine failure, rejects takeoff and the aircraft comes to a complete halt. So that is the difference between the required and the available distance. Next is the takeoff distance required. It is the distance required by an aircraft on takeoff roll from the beginning, accelerates to V1, suffers an engine failure, and continues with the takeoff and reaches a screen height of 35 feet. As per regulations, it is the greater of the requirements of the total distance as required for the above mentioned definition or the distance required by the aircraft to continue on both the engines and get airborne and crossing the height 35 feet multiplied by a factor of 115 percent. I just brought this figure so that you can recap the available distances, the takeoff distance available, the accelerate stop distance available and the takeoff run available. As uh, you learn the required distance, I want you to realize that all the distances available are all fixed whereas the required distances would be calculated for every takeoff and it will be compared with the available distances and a decision to continue with the uh, takeoff with altered parameters uh, would be made. Okay, before going to the actual uh, subject, we will see how, what is the sequence uh, of a normal takeoff. In a normal takeoff, 
as the aircraft accelerates, picks up speed. The first speed that which catches the attention of the crew is 100 knots. This is a kind of a alternate speed for uh, BMCG. And in any case, there is not going to be much of a difference. But 100 knots is a safe speed for most of the jets. And in some uh, jets, they keep it at 80 knots. So there is actually a standard call by the co-pilot warning of the 100 knots. So once the 100 knot is crossed, in actual, we should be crossing the BMCG. But there is no warning for that. Then as the aircraft accelerates further, next we encounter the V1 speed. V1 is the decision speed. Uh, we already learned the definition. The pilot, uh, at this point onwards, the pilot uh, has no discretion to reject the takeoff because the performance of the aircraft wouldn't permit to do so. He will continue to accelerate and then when the VR is called, he will gently rotate the plane to a takeoff attitude and the aircraft will get automatic get airborne and uh, on a two engine, the aircraft will cross uh, a screen height of 35 feet with a speed greater than V2. This is how a normal takeoff sequence carries on. Okay, let's move further. In this section, I will explain what happens if the pilot encounters an engine failure at V1. The aircraft accelerates, crosses 100 knots VMCG and as he reaches V1, there is an engine failure which he detects. Now, as we learned from uh, definitions, uh, a two second delay is permissible for the pilot to initiate action to stop takeoff or continue with the takeoff. Let's assume for this section that the pilot decides to continue with the takeoff. Now, the aircraft is on a single engine, therefore power is uh, that much limited. The acceleration is going to be slow and the VR is going to be reached further away from where it could have reached on a two engine. Now the lift off would have to be gentle and he is not going to get the rate of climb which he got in two engines. Now here onwards it will be a very slow rate of climb. Then at least he should cross 35 feet and reach speed V2 by the end of the clear way which is the takeoff distance required. Let us assume that the pilot decides to reject the takeoff. The aircraft commences roll, encounters the normal speeds. At P1, he detects an engine failure and after two seconds, he initiates actions for a re reject takeoff. That is close thrust levers and applied brakes and speed brakes. Now, the aircraft decelerates and comes to a complete halt by end of the stop wheel. Okay, let's move on further. Let me introduce you to the concept of balanced field line. We all learned that on a takeoff roll, as the aircraft accelerates and reaches V1, and if the aircraft suffers an engine failure, the pilot has got two options, either to continue with the takeoff or to take reject takeoff actions. Now, let's consider the option of a reject takeoff. The aircraft accelerates up to V1, engine failure and the pilot initiates reject takeoff actions and aircraft comes to a complete halt within the accelerate stop distance available that is the takeoff run available plus the stop weight. In the alternate scenario where the pilot would uh, elect to continue with the takeoff after having suffered an engine failure he will accelerate and continue with the takeoff. In this case the balance field length requirement stipulates that the aircraft will reach the screen height of 35 feet with V2 in exactly the same distance as aircraft took for reject takeoff that is the accelerate stop distance available or required that is the runway plus the stop rate. Therefore in such a scenario where the pilot continues with the takeoff the clear way is not considered for the balance field length requirements or definition.
by now you all would have understood how important is this v1 so we will spend uh, some more time time to discuss this v1 first thing i want you all to understand and realize is that if there is an engine failure at v1 the aircraft acceleration will be much slower than what it would do on a twin engine secondly nowadays the engine technologies have improved vastly and the reliability has improved drastically now most of the jets we are able to bring the v, uh, v1 vr v2 being equal that is v1 is equal to vr equal to v2 but only under critical circumstances extremely high temperatures or uh, shorter runway lengths do we need to alter v1 earlier we used to discuss the concept of v1 vr ratio equal to 1 nowadays we are not discussing it that much but i want you to understand that most of the aircraft satisfied this condition of v1 of vr ratio equal to 1 and there was a limit up to which this v1 vr ratio would be reduced while we are on the subject i thought it is a good idea to discuss this graph which i have come across in this book called getting to grips with aircraft performance by Airbus. On the x-axis is shown the V1, and on the y-axis is shown the distances, the runway distances. Notice, firstly, there are two lines, one in purple and one in olive green. As the V1 increases, these two, which are indicating the takeoff distance on single engine and takeoff run on single engine, reduce gradually over the range of increase in V1. Whereas these two distances. for both engine operations that is shown in blue and olive green remain fairly constant over almost entire range of v1 that is possible next this is the accelerate stop distance required which is shown in red is gradually increasing as the v1 increases i want you to uh, ponder over this graph and try to understand it. now let's see the point where the accelerate stop distance required is equal to take off distance on single engine required where these two lines intersect would be the v1 for the balanced field length but practically as the distance reduces let's see the intersection point of take off run single engine and accelerate stop distance required these two are different points which indicates that a range of v1 is possible so pilot has got option to, to choose uh, the range uh, any v1 within this range the practical usage of it is we will discuss later now that uh, you have fairly understood how important this v1 i just want to add two more points practically we would use the v1 manipulation that is Uh, reduction of v1 in case we have to uplift some more marginal payload on short runways you have to think over it and then understand second point which i want to bring to your notice is the limits of v1 r the lower most limit is the vmcg and the higher most limit is the vr very self explanatory okay let's see the v2 v2 is the take off safety speed it is as important as v1 but there's far less manipulations that are possible it's almost a fixed speed for a particular all up right and the pilot has got no discretion to alter it let's see the definition v2 is the minimum climb speed that must be reached at a height of 35 feet above the runway surface in case of an engine failure v2 min that is the minimum limit of v2 in terms of calibrated air speed may not be less than 1.13 vsr that is the reference stalling speed if you remember we had discussed it some time back and it should not be less than 1.1 times vmc a very self explanatory but i just want to add a small point in order to achieve the v2 the pilot should not lower his attitude and maintain a uh, lower attitude why because in that case he will extend his distance to reach 
the height of 35 feet because he is going to get less rate of climb. Therefore, it is very important that he exactly reaches B2 at a height of 35 feet. Let's see some factors that will affect takeoff performance. Runway elevation. Higher the airfield elevation, higher is the pass for a given CAS. All performance gradually deteriorate with higher altitude, also due to engine considerations. Lineup correction. The aircraft would roll up forward to straighten the nose wheel. Also, if uh, the aircraft were to backtrack and carry out a 180 degree turn, it would use up some more runway. They usually, a standard figure of approximately 50 feet is catered for and incorporated in the aircraft flight manual. Any variations would be reflected in the flight manual. The C of G position. The position of center of gravity can have marginal effects. A detailed explanation would be covered in a different lesson. I just want you to know that C of G position will affect the performance on take. Slope of the runway. Any downward slope gives a good acceleration on takeoff but increases the stop distance. And the other way around if there is an upward slope. The overall effect will be defined in the flight manual of the aircraft. In general, a downward Slope is positive for takeoff. The weather conditions, humidity, temperature, pressure, all these three put together, essentially the weather affects the density altitude and higher density altitude leads to erosion of aircraft performance. Winds, headwinds are always beneficial for takeoff. Flaps, higher the flap setting, lesser is the takeoff run required. But this results in deteriorated performance after takeoff. Next uh, is the flying technique, which we shall uh, discuss now, and it's fairly important. The flight manual will describe the actual technique uh, as to how to carry out a takeoff but we will discuss it in general. In that, the pilot has to apply the forward pressure on the takeoff roll. This will exert downward pressure and the tires are able to make firm contact on the runway, thereby increasing the acceleration characteristics of the aircraft. But if sufficient forward pressure is not applied, notice that the area of contact of the tires with the runway is very less and therefore the acceleration characteristics will be deteriorated which may result in increase in takeoff run required or accelerate stop distance required. Similarly, crosswind uh, flying techniques depending on the tailplane design of the aircraft that would be described in the flight manual. Next is the MEL, the minimum equipment list. It is possible that the aircraft may be cleared to fly with some systems not functioning. In such cases, the flight manual and the document called the MEL, minimum equipment list, will specify a con condition under which such flight may be undertaken. Some such conditions may restrict the takeoff weight.
Congratulations to all of you, those who have gone through this lesson patiently. You have been able to understand takeoff. You have taken off. The end of takeoff is marked by the aircraft reaching 35 feet, which is called the screen height, at a speed of V2 or above. Now, this point is very important because this marks the end of the takeoff phase and marks the beginning of the next phase, which is called the segment clamp, which we shall see in the next uh, lesson in great detail, as much as we saw it in takeoff. Hey, once again, thank you all for uh, going through the lesson. Please feel free to write your comments and uh, your ideas and if there are any factual errors on the mail shown here. Thank you.